So now we are going to move on and we are going to talk about how do we measure an, uh, carbon. So we know what is carbon, now we know what is important, we know what are the challenges in our countries to make it happen, so what we need to be addressed, but I think as some of uh, you commented, one of the challenges is to actually measure it. Okay, how much carbon do we have? Where is it? Because apparently these general estimates might not be very accurate for some of our areas. So let's start with what are the carbon pools. So which part of these natural habitats have carbon? So quite straightforward, the trees, what we call above ground life tree biomass. Oh, I think, sorry, I forgot my point. Eh? So we have the trees, then we have the bushes on grassland in some environments, maybe the trees are not so many, so we need to measure these others. We have the dead wood that somebody already mentioned. We have the litter, so in deciduous forest, this is a lot more than in evergreen forest. So you see in different habitats, different compartments, pools of carbon are more important. We have the roots, the below life biomass, and then we have the soil, and in the soil we can also have the pit. So we start talking about how do we measure above ground biomass. Mostly I'll start talking about the trees. How do we measure the trees? AGB is it can be the trees or the bushes and other vegetation, but above the ground. So we can measure it from the sky using two things. Remote sensing, like images from satellites, or using space or airborne LIDAR. The difference, if you remember, that the LIDAR is more like a scanner. We send the thing and then it returns. So let's start from the first one. We have these beautiful Landsat or other images from the sky. And what way we can do is we can actually relate the wavelengths, the image that I think it was Ben that showed yesterday. You know, we have the visual waves and the heat waves and these other waves. So we can relate it to the biomass. And in a way, this is pretty cool. Eh? We don't even need to go to the field. We just download our images. We try to find a relationship and then we have our map. This is Lope National Park in Gabon. Eh? What is the problem? Well, the first problem is that sometimes these sensors didn't collect the data from other area. So you see, this sensor, huh, no data from part of the park. Sorry, we cannot use it. Second problem, some of these uh, relationships between these different, uh, that we get from the remote sensing, some of them, they saturate. It means they're very good for finding the difference in carbon between a grassland and a shrubland, maybe even savanna. But after, for example, for the pulsar, after about 150, 180, you cannot see the difference anymore. So actually here, you can see it's much greener, there's more carbon, but here, using this sensor, we didn't see, just because the relationship kind of stops. It doesn't work beyond a certain point. So it's good for some environments, for some habitats, but bad for maybe the tropical rainforest where we have a lot. One way to deal with it is that we can actually adapt this, so we use this remote sensing information with some plots measured in the ground, and in this case, this paper, they also use some LIDAR, they combined everything, and they came up with this map, very famous, because it created a lot of controversy when we talk about red, because every country now knows how much it has. You can agree or not, you can go and measure, like Tanzania did. But this is what is out there, what they created. Sachi paper. You can see there's more biomass in the Amazon, in the Congo Basin, and this is just the trees. Eh? This is not the pit that I was telling you before, Southeast Asia. One way to measure biomass and then carbon. Another way is that you can just classify your area in forest types or vegetation types. Then we know that maybe the swamp forest, there's few trees, there's more, um, sorry, more palms, so we have less biomass above the ground, not on the pit, this blue area. And then we have other forest types, with some have more deciduous species, some are more evergreen, and then we can make the calculations. But of course, once we classify our image, we need to know for every type of forest how much it is. So we still either go to the literature or we calculate putting plots here. So this is good to know what we have, but we still need to decide for every land cover class which value do we use. And I mean, just briefly, yeah, this, uh, this photo, sorry, this classification is this area here. So you see here it all looks between 350 and 40, but actually we have a lot of forest types. 
So actually not each of them has the same value. So it depends on the scale. If our project area is a small, maybe we do want to assess the difference between the forest types because then we know better, we might have more carbon like the study we saw from Tanzania. Another way to do it is using LiDAR. So LiDAR is like this kind of laser that scans the trees. This study was done at the forest in Kilimanjaro and it looks like this. They, they flew a plane that had this sensor, you see, and they kind of took this image. Looks like a grassland patch, but it's a forest. And then they relate the height. So here is a bit open, here is a bit open. There was maybe a tree that fall and clear, and this, they know the height of every place. And then from the height of the trees, here you can see also a taller tree that is reddish, and this is the understory that is bluish. They can relate the height to the biomass. Which is pretty cool, eh? I mean, I think this is pretty cool. The problem, flying these in a plane is pretty expensive. So it's not available from everywhere. The other one is that if we use the LiDAR, it's available on satellites. They haven't scanned the whole, con I mean, the whole continent. Eh? Maybe somebody paid to scan Rwanda, but not Zambia. So it depends on the country, the data that we can get. And I would add, and usually it's not for free, but anyway. So this is really cool, but it's obviously not available everywhere. Then we go to the, and even when we use these, the, the relationship that they use with the height to the biomass is also um, estimated using ground measurement. So even when we use remote sensing, the idea is that we still need to measure trees on the ground. So now we move to the next step. How do we measure these trees on the ground? So we can cut them, we can use an equation, so we don't need to destroy them, or we can scan them. Let's start with the first one. Pretty straightforward. We cut the tree, we dry it, we weight it, and then we know the biomass. And about 0.47, so about 47% of the dry biomass of a tree is carbon, about half. This is pretty easy, eh, if you work in the savanna. When you work in the Congo forest, where trees are, I can tell you, up to two, sometimes three meters diameter, 60 meters tall. Hey. It's very expensive to get a balance eh, that can count this for you. And obviously, if you work in a national park, like our colleague was saying, oh, I want to calculate for a national park. You know, if you chop your trees first, eh, then it doesn't look very good, you are a scientist. And anyway, which carbon will you sell if now you chop them? <laughs> so this is good, but you know it's not feasible all the time. And what, is, what has been done, so people chopped a lot of trees, and then they made an equation. And this is the famous guy that did this, called Chave, he's a professor. So what he did, he relied the diameter of the tree. So bef before uh, cutting the tree, first it measured it. How was the diameter of the trunk? How tall was it? And then also which species was it? So we know the wood density. And he created this equation, so everybody else uses. So me, I work in DRC, I don't cut any tree. Eh? I just measure the diameter and then I use this equation. So it's good, but of course it's not perfect. Because when they build this equation, they use data from all these plots, mostly logging concessions that were going to cut the trees anyway. And the professor went and said, hey, before you cut, can you also measure the branches for me because I'm working on this project, which was great. But obviously it's not everywhere. So for example, if you work in Ethiopia, the forests are drier and shorter than in other places. So the equation is not very good for you. You will overestimate the biomass you have. So. One way to go around it is to build your local equation for your country. But of course, this also costs money and somebody needs to invest in it. So they did it in Tanzania. I think there's at least three or four publications about it. But for other countries, it hasn't been done yet. So we use the general. Another way in the field when you measure the trees that comes up is, OK, wh where do I measure them? How many do I need to measure? So there's mostly, I would say, two protocols are very popular. The BCS, the one that I show you for the carbon projects, they use the small circles. In the little circle, they measure everything that it's from 5 to 20 centimeters. In the middle circle, they measure from 20 to 50. And in the bigger circle, everything above 50. This is pretty fast. Eh? The problem is eh, that in the field, it's hard to know if a tree is in or out when you are in the limit. Because humans are good at perceiving square lines but terrible at circles. So this creates a problem in the field. But it's, I mean, this is accepted. I'm not saying it's, I'm just saying it's challenging sometimes. So this is the one I mostly use. So we put very big plots, 100 by 100. We measure everything inside. But you know, we put the rope. Eh? When we decide this is 100, we put the rope. So no argument, the tree is in or out, because the rope tells you. 
So squares are better. I mean, these are very big. Some people use smaller. I think square is much better than circle just because it's easier to see the edge. Because there's a study done that shows that people tend to feel bad to miss trees, so they include them. So they tend to include more trees at the edge than they should. So putting squares is always easier, I think. Then, of course, we measure the trees in the field, and one might think that this is pretty straightforward, but some people in the room have measured a lot of trees in their life by now, and they know that measuring trees in the tropics, especially in the rainforest, is not straightforward. Because the trees have funny shapes, they have the, the planches or the buttresses, they have the funny roots, and it can get confusing on how you go about measuring them. Just as a hint, we use a ladder to measure trees in the field. This ladder is about four meters, and this colleague of mine is climbing the tree to get to the place where is a cylinder. You see? This is Wapaka. Wapaka guineensis for those that are botanists. So you see, the equation was built using trees that had cylinder shape. So we need to get to the cylinder shape, because if we measure the tree here, it would seem like it's much bigger and it has a lot more carbon than it actually has. So measuring things on the ground is not easy. We measure diameter, height, mostly using a laser. Some people use clinometers. And then usually people don't take samples of good density because it's time consuming. They usually just check the species and search in a database. Of course, the database is not complete. Some species are missing, but well, that's as good as it gets at the moment. Then the other way, apart from cutting the trees or measuring using the allometric equation, we can also scan them. And I think this is super cool. The problem is that it's also expensive. So this is a scanner. I can tell you it costs about $200,000. And carrying it around is not so easy. It also needs to charge the batteries every night. So for some places of the world, it might not be so straightforward. So this uh, friend of mine actually came to Gabon to scan the trees and to see if it was feasible. Because the idea was that scanning with a, this a scanner on the ground in European forests or US, it's pretty straightforward. The forest is quite open. But the rainforest is very close. There's lots of lianas, there's lots of stems. So the idea was that the laser would not be able to go through. They succeeded. They just had to modify the protocol. And it's really cool. They get these kind of points, and they can est estimate the exact volume of every tree. So it's very precise. But those of us that are botanists in the room will realize that the machine doesn't tell them the species. <laughs> so they get very cool and exact volumes. They still need go a botanist to go and tell them which species so they can know the wood density. So the thing is moving forward, but it's still not there yet. So um, then the question comes, is like, OK, we know how to measure our trees. But now how do we upscale? How do we go from our plot level? either our little plot or one hectare plot, how we do, do we go to our whole protected area or how, our whole ranch that we want to turn into a carbon project. So there's different ways to do it, and I'll just show you a couple. One of them is, for example, you can interpolate. So this is from Kakameka in Kenya. So this lady measured all these plots in the rainforest. You see all the black dots. And then she used this kind of uh, inverse distance weighting. It's something you can do in QGIS pretty easy. Let's say, OK, if this plot has a lot of carbon and these two and these two, this area here must have a lot of carbon too. It's pretty straightforward, eh? and it's better than nothing. But of course, we don't know what was happening in some areas if we don't have the plots. So the accuracy can be discute. You know, you can discuss if it's good or not. Then you can go a step further in your QGIS skills and now you developed and you say, okay, apart from, I will not just interpolate like just what it's nearby. I will actually look at other variables that might explain this difference in biomass. Maybe the elevation, maybe the slope, maybe the distance to roads. So this is the example I showed you before from Sierra Leone. And one of the things they considered was the historical logging. So this was the volume that was locked and recovered before, and from the gray areas that didn't have information. So they build a linear model, kind of different correlations, how every variable explains the biomass of the ones we measured, and then we can predict in the places that we didn't measure. So that's another way to do it. So it's a mix of field measurements and some other variables. Of course, you need to have these other variables available. Eh? In some parts, we don't have documents showing the historical logging, for example. And then, as I said before, we can also use just classify our 
study area into land use types. So we can classify our forest in different types of forest and then we measure it. But we just multiply. So if we know that our swamp forest has only 50 tons per hectare, we have 10 plots from there, okay, every swamp forest will get this value. Is another way to go around it. Then this was for trees, but how do we measure the other carbon poles? So if we have lianas and palms, we can use this like for trees. We can either cut them or use an equation or scan them with lighter. Just as a hint, obviously lianas are smaller than trees, so they have less carbon. Some have hard wood though, but palms are usually really, really low on carbon. I mean, it's not really wood. Eh? I mean, nobody even builds with palms. Then uh, if we have smaller uh, vegetation like bushes or grasses, people usually cut them dry them, I mean they don't cut the whole grassland, eh? they would cut a few plots, dry them, weight them and they just know the biomass straight. For the roots, we usually use a ratio, this is available in the literature, we can also argue how accurate it is for some regions, we don't have the information but it's an estimate about 0.25 for what we have above the ground. And then for litter, people usually also just harvest it, we collect all the litter in a little patch, we dry it, we weight it, we know the biomass. For that wood, so for that wood it depends if it's a standing or if it's fallen. If it's a standing, we use this equation here, you don't need to remember. The idea is that if it's a standing, we kind of use a kind of a cone that it's bigger in the bottom than in the top and the, the density of the wood will be greater. It's not as rotten, eh? otherwise it would be already in the ground. And when it's laying down, we usually use another equation that is more like a cylinder because we mostly measure the bigger part. So how we do it in the field, you usually just measure this, the, a bit like an equation, the, the height and the diameter, and then you usually classify it in rotten. And that is pretty funny, eh? because people always think that we scientists are super precise. Eh? And for the dead wood, I can tell you, you use the kicking technique, which is like this. You kick, if you hurt yourself, it's class one, very hard. You kick, if it moves a little bit in, a little bit rotten. If you kick and it can fall apart, it's very rotten. Very scientific, eh? But then, of course, you need to collect samples of each category and you weight them, dry them and weight them in the lab and then you can relate it. But in the field, it's, gone like, it's done like that with the kicking technique. And then you use the different equations to estimate the biomass.